we're live. Let's wait for um, let's wait for a few minutes for more people to join in in the audience, and then we get started. All right. Hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Twice. Uh, I am Shweta Nadapani. I am a community builder at Be Waste Twice. So the topic for today's webinar is how U.S. waste and recycling operators are navigating new regulations for PFAS. We have Megan Quinn, who's a senior reporter at Waste Dive, moderating this webinar. Megan has moderated other webinars uh, on Be Waste Twice. You can head to the webinar section of our website, or you can also go to uh, you can go to our website and go to her particular profile, and you will be able to find them. We also have Cole Rosengren from Waste Drive who moderates other webinars for us. So please do head to the webinar section to find more. Uh, today, Megan's gonna talk to Anne Germain, who's the Chief, Oper Chief Operating Officer and Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at National Waste and Recycling Association. David Wagger, Chief Scientist and Director of Environmental Management Recycled Materials Association. And Kristen Oldendorf, Director of Public Policy, a Solid Waste Association of North America. Uh, just a few housekeeping things to remind you of. Your questions along with the registrations have come in and Megan's going to weave that into the conversation itself. Other than that, please use the Q&A section for other questions. If you do not have a question, you just have a comment to add based on the conversation that's happening, please feel free to use chat. And we will also keep, and please introduce yourself in chat. We would love to know who's joining the webinar. So over to you, Megan. Okay. Well, thank, thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Um, I'm really excited to uh, have this discussion. Um, being based in North America and specifically the United States, where very recently the US EPA has um, updated uh, regulations for certain PFAS, which do have impacts for the waste and recycling industry. So it's been a busy year. These are um, impacts that uh, the industry has been waiting for for a long time. But just because those regulations are out doesn't mean that there aren't still lots of questions and lots of things for the industry to kind of get into about, you know, what does this mean for operations, for business, for the environment? So I'm really excited to have this discussion with y'all. Um, <clears throat> before we get into that, we uh, wanted to uh, start with a little sort of fun poll just to kind of check in with the audience to see um, where y'all are coming from into this discussion. And uh, we kind of want to start with a little fun kind of uh, quiz, uh, easy quiz probably, if you know anything about PFAS. Um, so yeah, our first question, um, just to kind of, you know, start this off is when were PFAS first made? Um, we've got a multiple choice that's probably popping up on your screen now. Um, unfortunately, don't get a prize for answering this correctly, other than the knowledge that you're in the right place. And if you get this wrong, that's also okay. You're still in the right place. Uh, should we share the results, so Megan? We've had quite a few participants respond to it. Yes. Go ahead. Yep, so yeah, 1930s. Pretty wild to see that in some form or another, um, some kinds of PFAS have been around for that long. Um, yeah, I'm also curious for our second question, which is, um, you know, what industries PFAS have been used in? So let's see. I, I'm going to share the results now. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> kind of a softball question. Um, all of these industries, you're seeing impacts of um, PFAS being used in all of these industries. And obviously also in the waste and recycling industries, though um, not being used in the waste and recycling industries, but there are impacts for us. So yeah, well, before we really get into it with the panelists, um, I'm already seeing some folks in the chat uh, introduce themselves, but we're curious, what has brought you to this webinar? Um, where are you from? 
um, you know, what's sort of your background in uh, PFAS um, and like where you are, are there any PFAS that are being banned from manufacturing where you are and sort of what kind of rules are you looking at? So whatever you want to put in the chat, just to kind of introduce yourself and sort of what your background is. Um, we'd love to see that so we can kind of frame our discussion um, to where folks are showing up in this conversation. So as um, people are weighing in there, wanted to start off our um, panel discussion. So all the folks on this panel uh, are parts of associations based in um, North America that cover some aspects of uh, the, the waste or recycling industry. Um, so uh, I guess just sort of an intro question for all three of you, if you could talk a little bit just about what sector of the industry your association represents and then what your members biggest concerns currently are with PFAS so um, whoever wants to start that off just to kind of give us an intro okay I'll, I'll go first uh and Jermaine I'm with the National Waste and Recycling Association uh thanks again for having me um so our members are the private sector waste and recycling industry so predominantly municipal solid waste and their major concerns are um, with respect to the CERCLA hazardous substance designation that EPA has made. Um, obviously, there's uh, PFAS coming from landfills. We understand that EPA last January has decided to also um, establish uh, ELG's effluent limitation guidelines for PFAS, but the bigger concern and the greater risk is associated with the CERCLA designation. Um, I can go next. Uh, so I'm Kristen Oldendorf uh, with SWANA. So the Solid Waste Association of North America, we're an individual membership association. So we have about 10,000 members throughout North America. Um, so similar to NWRA, it's different parts of the industry, you know, landfill operators, as well as compost operators, um, recycling facilities. Um, and more, uh, people handling collections and communications and things like that. Uh, and we handle, um, our members are both public and private sector, as well as, you know, nonprofits, universities, uh, it's really a, a range. Um, and similar to the issues that Anne brought up, it's a lot of, um, some of the concerns are just around the uncertainty of what the future looks like, the need for additional research, um, and really just figuring out for each facility, what does this mean for them? How do they need to start budgeting and planning? What kind of technology should they get in place? Um, so really just trying to figure out what the path forward looks like um, from a regulatory standpoint, as well as kind of understanding the different technologies. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are. I want to thank B WasteWise for inviting me as well as Waste Dive uh, for, for moderating. Uh, again, my name is David Wagger. I am the Chief Scientist and Director of Environmental Management at the Recycle Materials Association, REMA, formerly known as ISRI, or the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries. Uh, we represent private sector and some other types of public sector uh, oriented recyclers. We have about 1,700 members, more than 4,000 locations over the world. Our membership is international. I'll be focusing mostly on U.S. issues. Um, where our members are, are sort of located in the supply chain is when materials are no longer uh, being used for, say, their uh, original purpose. Some of our members say repair electronics and send them in for reuse or for those that cannot be repaired and reused, they're recycled. Our members recycle all sorts of things like automobiles, appliances, paper, plastics, glass, uh, rubber, textiles. Uh, you know, as the polls suggested, P PFAS has been around for a long time. It was first synthesized in the 30s and 40s, but went commercial in the 50s, and it's been used in various molecular identities since then. Um, as you saw the other poll, they're used in a, a vast number of industries. That list was not exhaustive. And, and that's the challenge is that things that are made with PFAS, whether they're a coating, whether they're the actual material, perhaps like a fluorinated polymer, or whether they're a processing aid and residual amounts re remain on the products or materials that go in the economy, eventually our members will get them, whether it's a matter of months, years, or decades. Um, so it's really pretty much whatever is put in the economy, our members are going to end up being uh, handling. And to the extent that EPA is regulating PFAS under all acts, not simply CERCLA or Superfund, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act, for those who want to know what it means, but under Resource Conservation Recovery Act, Clean Water Act, 
uh, Toxic Substances Control Act, all of those are going to have potentially uh, significant, potentially adverse impacts on the recycled materials industry uh, for chemicals that we never designed or chose to use, but because of the way the regulations are rolled out, whoever ends up owning them ends up being responsible for all their aspects. Um, and uh, that is what I'm watching very carefully. Um, we've just begun to see these, say, in some states in their industrial stormwater permits. I think that's the first thing that's really rolling out. But if you read EPA's plan um, they're, they're, and, and the regulatory agenda, pretty much they're uh, having uh, uh, PFAS-related requirements in all the regulations under all the major acts. Yeah. Yeah. So wide ranging um, impacts here uh, for the industry as a whole. Um, I'm looking through the chat to see who's joining us. A lot of folks do come from, um, you know, uh, waste companies, recycling companies, uh, people who work in uh, sustainability. So, you know, I think we've got a pretty knowledgeable audience here um, in terms of um, sort of like coming from this industry. I do hope we can get like just before we move into some of the really meaty questions um just for some of the folks that are uh joining us learning more just about PFAS impacts in general can you all maybe expand a little bit just on some of where PFAS is showing up in your industry in terms of facilities you you mentioned already you know stormwater you know different materials and maybe get a little more specific into um, where PFAS is showing up for you and why that is a concern currently. Um, I don't know who wants to, to talk about that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go since you kind of yeah. mentioned something I mentioned. Um, yeah. So they're sort of showing up in the front gate and then there's what happens once it's in the front gate. Uh, we know we know <laughs> relatively little about both. Um, it seems that every once in a while we discover or it's reported that there's a PFAS that was unknown to be used in a certain industry for a certain product that is showing up. And then it's sort of, oh, well, now we're aware of it. We have to deal with it. Um, I think there's a little bit of information, but not a lot of expansive information about sort of what happens to it in the recycling process. Uh, which way does it go? Um, you know, the challenge with PFAS, and people have tried to make analogies to other, let's say, organic chemicals, say PCBs or other things. Yeah, you know, the, the the issue with PFAS, especially, other than it's been around a long time, it's already in the hydrological cycle since it's been used for decades. It's kind of already sort of out there. Is that the concentrations of concern are extremely low? We're in par talking about parts per trillion. Other things are parts per million, which is a million times more concentrated. Uh, but when you are concerned about parts per trillion or even subparts per trillion, depending on you know, what you read, that makes it extremely difficult to address because we're approaching the limits of detectability, uh, at least with, with reliability anyway. It's one thing to detect it. It's another thing to quantitate it to say, how much is there? And does that pose a risk to human health or the environment? That's really what I think needs to be answered very clearly. And certainly uh, I would advocate for uh, 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 sort of a risk-based approach is that you take care of the riskiest problems first and don't concentrate a lot of your energy on things that probably aren't that risky. Just from a, we don't have infinite resources to deal with a massive problem. So tacking on to that, you know, I agree on the um, very low concentrations. You know, we're looking at uh, the drinking water rules established four parts per trillion for both PIPO and PFOS. So obviously very challenging, so d difficult to detect, but also difficult to remove uh, something that's already at that detection limit. If you're removing 99%, that might not be good enough. And so, you know, people are talking about how many nines can you remove? Um, all that being said, it's there's also a challenge on as Megan, to your question, you know, where is it showing up? So we know it's coming into the landfills, but where it's coming from and how much is going out um, and what percentage is still, I think, um, in its infancy. Some people have tried to do um, uh, a balance um, to figure out like how much is staying in the landfills versus how much is leaving. Where it's leaving from primarily is through the leachate. So the leachate does get treated, but the fact is that most of the, of the country, um, the landfills treat their leachate using a wastewater treatment plant. And there may or may not be any efforts to remove the PFAS at the wastewater treatment plant. 
and then it might end up in the biosolids. And so we have a full circle where the biosolids are now um, struggling to be able to manage those materials. Um, but with respect to how much is coming in, um, EPA recently did a report and they said that about 90% is staying in the landfill. Um, but it was really interesting because they ended up saying 6,600 um, it was 6,600 pounds of material, um, or I'm sorry, 6,600 kilograms of material are what goes to the landfills, all landfills across the country. That's, you know, if you divide that by three uh, 2,000 landfills, that's about, you know, 3.3 kilograms or 6.6 .6 pounds per year per landfill. Um, it's very, very low levels. And so, to be able to say something that low seems extraordinarily um, challenging to be able to find um, those six pounds of materials, especially when they come in every product. It's coming in through paper. It's coming in through plastic. It's coming in, you know, on the construction debris material. It's coming in the carpets. Um, so how that gets quantified and uh, established at such a low level, it's... Um, really difficult to say. Uh, and then, you know, you read other reports like Keen Shoes uh, did an analysis and they say that they are now PFAS free and it took them years to get that way. But they say through their efforts, they removed 25 tons of PFAS from entering commerce. So when we have a report from the EPA that says only seven tons of material of PFAS are going to all the landfills in the country. And then you have one small company that now claims to have removed 25 tons of PFAS through their efforts. We have a little bit of a disparity and I think there's still a lot of uncertainty in where it's all coming from. But to your point, uh, leachate is our primary uh, concern, but it's also in our compost. It's also in our recyclables. Um, so, you know, it's everywhere. Uh, I'll just add to that. Well, I want to preface this by saying, you know, despite all these challenges, we really see our industry as part of the solution. And, you know, while a lot of the quantities are unknown, there have been a lot of studies that show that, you know, that the majority of the PFAS coming into a landfill stays there. Um, you know, maybe 11% or so, some of the studies show leave through the leachate, but the leachate is also being treated. Um, also looking at, you know, incineration and waste energy, a lot of studies have showed that they're very effective means in destroying PFAS. So we really do see the industry as part of the solution in that way. Um, on the other hand, we know these chemicals are very persistent, the same, you know, we often say the same reasons that make them so, I, you know, why they're in so many products and why they're, you know, used in that way also make them really hard to uh, destroy. They're very persistent. So thinking about that material staying in the leachate and ending up in bio cells and ending up in the water, those are things that we're concerned with. So while you know much of the focus lately has been on treatment around PFAS and effectively handling that, um, we are also thinking about what does this mean for compost. Um, you know, just recently, for example, the Environmental Protection Agency released a, a national strategy on food waste and loss in organics. So they're really looking at how nationally can we advance organics management within uh, the U.S. Um, and the original draft of that didn't talk much about PFAS, but we know it's an issue. It's in this material. Um, so it's really thinking about there's just so many material streams that we do need to be concerned with and think about how PFAS would have an impact on them. Yeah. And while we're on the topic of, of compost and organics, I do know that someone had um, submitted a question uh, prior to this webinar about that. Um, and I wanted to just kind of get into that, first of all, because I do see that there are some um, uh, compost and organics folks on this call. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious about, um, you know, like, what does that look like for your your industries right now? I mean, I don't know that this would apply as much to, to Rima, um, though David definitely weigh in if, if it is. But um, what, like, what is Swan and NWRA sort of talking about in terms of like that aspect of it? And, you know, like where that's showing up, what are, what are folks thinking about in that regard right now? So can, I'm sorry, Megan, 
say the question again? Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm just curious about, so how NWRA is approaching um, uh, organics and compost, that aspect of it with, when, with regards to PFAS, like what kind of conversations are you having with members of, you know, other associations and, you know, groups that you guys connect with and, you know, what is that conversation looking like and how is that being addressed? So, you know, one of the things that we really have advocated for um, across the industry is, you know, if we do source reduction, it would do such a better job for uh, us. And we've already seen that with some of the temporal changes that we've noticed in the landfills. So if you look at um, leachate over time, some of the older leachate had higher concentration of the PFAS that are of concern. And, you know, one of the things that's really important to mention is that not all PFAS are the same. Obviously, it's a class of chemicals that has over 10,000 of them, but PFO and PFOS are the ones that are of primary concern. And we have seen in leachate that the PFO and PFOS have declined over time in the leachate. So that shows that some of the voluntary um, uh, cessation of manufacturing of those PFAS um, have resulted in lower concentrations. And so one of the things that we think is really important if we want to be able to do um, appropriate composting is to try and get it out of there in the first place, because there's no way that the composters are going to be able to pull uh, compost out. Uh, our PFAS out. And we do want to be able to increase our compost. So what we do know is that yard waste has the lowest amount of PFAS. It has a little bit because as we know, if you look for it, you'll find it. The second lowest is um, food waste and food waste. But then if you start doing food contact um, or food contact packaging in there, compostable packaging, that has the highest concentration. And so it goes higher the more you go um, up towards the de degradable organics. And so um, there is there are limits. Um, there is a, a standard that uh, some states have established for um, what can be considered compostable. And that is set at total fluorine of 100 parts per million. So uh, I just want to do a comparison to what David said earlier about when we start talking about parts per trillion, 100 parts per million as being uh, considered to have no deliberately added uh, PFAS, that's 100 million parts per trillion. And so, you know, that's just uh, shows how difficult it is because Food contact packaging is now considered to be pretty much PFAS free at that low level of 100 parts per million. Yeah, I would agree with thinking about that reduction from the start. You know, a biggest, really big challenge with composting is contamination in general. And so the PFAS is coming in through, often through materials that shouldn't necessarily be added anyway. We know that PFAS is in a lot of fast food containers, for example. So you're really relying on, you know, on the consumer, on the resident to kind of know what's accepted in, in their curbside composting or their community composting or whatever it is. Um, so really being able to, you know, think about limits and bans on those, you know, packaging and materials that contain PFAS is really what we need to be looking at, um, as well as the outreach to residents on just, you know, what is actually accepted in the in the material, because it, yeah, once it's in there, it's a challenge. Um, and that back to that strategy, I mentioned the national strategy, it's, it is really important that we scale up composting, but you have to think about the whole system, you need an end product that's usable, we're not going to create all this compost. And then if it's full of PFAS, nobody wants it. So, um, you know, similar to the biocells, I saw some people in the chat mention that, um, you know, you want a product that's usable. And if farmers don't want material that's full of PFAS, then where do you put it? Um, and you could landfill it, but then it's like, why did you go through all the trouble of composting? <laughs> so yeah, really thinking about that source reduction is key there. Yeah. And, you know, uh, a big part of this conversation and, you know, something that I know each of your uh, uh, organizations, associations has talked about is the fact that um, you know, the waste and recycling industry considers themselves passive receivers. So, you know, uh, PFAS containing material is coming to your facilities. Um, you know, people don't know that they're putting PFAS stuff in their trash, PFAS is in everything. 
Um, and part yeah. of this, oh, sorry, I just want to chime in there. Yeah, I just wanted to reflect off of what, what Anne and Kristen just said, if, if before we go on to the next oh, subject. Oh, sure, I'm sorry, dude, yeah. No, no worries, it's all good. Um, so Kristen raised a really interesting point at the end, is that even if you somehow isolate it and separate it, what do you do with it? And I think we're going to address that later. Um, the other thing is, is that I think for the composting side of things, you know, those are products, whether food products or packaging, that have a relatively short life cycle, maybe on the order of months or less. You know, our industry, like I say, our industry gets stuff from the past. So, so if you recall the list of industries, again, not an exhaustive list. You had semiconductors, you had textiles, you had all of these industries that have used PFAS uh, historically. The lifetime of those products may be on the order of decades. So just because they've stopped now doesn't mean that our industry is going to suddenly see them stop showing up. They're going to show up for a while. And that's kind of the other side of the coin is longer live products, building products that won't come out of use for 50 years. Uh, they may be in those. Um, th there's just so many ways that they, it will show up even if you turned off sort of the spigot now. Um, so just want, just want to put that out there. Um, and yeah. I think I'll go on to the next point when you go to other other topics. Yeah, well, I just want to respond to that because I agree with you on the one hand, because I, I will say when they started uh, with the asbestos bans, um, we thought at the landfill I used to work at, we would have... Um, asbestos for 10 years and then after that it would be fully taken care of and i'm going to say that our landfill never stopped getting asbestos um you know we left we were getting probably the same amount of asbestos for the previous 20 years and it turns out it was really more a function of the capacity of the asbestos removal workers than um what uh what was being taken out but on the other hand i do want to point out again the temporal uh studies that we've seen and you know that correlates with us blood uh levels where they've looked at pfo and pfos in us blood and they have seen that the levels of the two um a chain pfas have uh drops you know by 60 and 80% over like a 10 year span now the thing is, they've replaced a lot of those um, A-chain PFAS with other PFAS and um, presumably less concerning PFAS. But, you know, Gen X was also considered a replacement PFAS at one point and is now considered to be one of the ones that are of concern. So to the extent that we, um, we've we seen reductions based on us. Uh, uh, them coming out of commerce, I, I think we have seen some positive effects there. Right. It, it, you're absolutely right. And we've seen this in other things like brominated flame retardants, where once they stop using them and say consumer electronics or other types of things, the exposures went down. But that is a separate but sort of connected issue to whether we will start, well, when we will stop seeing, and I don't think that's for a long time, PFAS you know, embedded or containing products will continue to show up. And the responsibility for those are kind of unlinked to uh, people's, uh, just the average blood lead level of, or blood level of, of PFAS, I misspoke there. Um, so, and then there's the other thing, and maybe we'll get to it, is that there are a lot of industries, I think, that say we can't phase it out for decades or a decade or so, and they'll continue to be allowed to use them but that doesn't necessarily absolve anyone downstream, whether it's our industry or your industry, from all of the negative attributes of those. So that they, they were free to use them and put them into products, but those who end up sort of handling them are stuck with all the bad attributes. And that, that is, seems to me a little bit unfair, but I think that's kind of the future that I think is going to happen because we can't instantaneously get rid of all of them. So there's kind of going to be some lag time, which is perhaps unavoidable at some level, that will continue to be responsible for them depending on how the regulations are written. Yeah. And 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 it's it's partly related to the super low levels that we're talking about. When you start talking parts per trillion, it's never going to go away because we're always going to find it everywhere. And I think that was evident when they did some of the testing on um virgin versus um recycled uh toilet paper. Uh they said every single one of them had concentrations, detectable concentrations of PFAS. And part of the, the stuff with the virgin, the trees aren't 
showing PFAS yet, but it's coming from the machinery. So it's it's in the manufacturing process and it's getting onto the toilet paper. And so, you know, it's never going to go away completely. The question is, what level can we live with? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, to that point, um, you know, and uh, have a lot of stuff coming up in, in the chat about this too, but, um, you know, th this, these things are still being uh, generated. They're still in our products. They're eventually getting disposed or recycled in some way. Um, they're coming to y'all's facilities. Um, and I don't want to talk about this too much because uh, I do want to get into some of the like, what do we do about it parts, but um, one thing that um, all of your groups have been uh, part of is um, trying to find ways within uh, these EPA regulations to um, you know have a passive receiver um, sort of acknowledgement of some kind. Um, this is something that um, you guys have been doing for several years before uh, the EPA uh, uh, put out their uh, hazardous substance designation. Um, I'm wondering if maybe just briefly, we can kind of do a little status update about how that's going. Maybe someone can just briefly explain like what I'm talking about, why why a passive receiver thing is, is uh, important to this industry and then sort of where we're at with that because the EPA has said that they're not that interested in, uh, you know, going after uh, certain types of landfills, for example. Um, but I know that that also um, some, some people feel like that leaves the door open. So um, maybe we could do who who would like to kind of give a little brief, you know, go first if you don't mind. Is that and then where where we're at with that? So we're we're kind of upstream at some level from the waste industry. Not always in every case, but recycling usually isn't perfect. We'd like it to be, but some things end up not being recyclable, so they end up as as solid waste typically. Um, but you know the idea of passive receiver or other states have used conduit facility that it kind of goes in and then goes out, whether in the products or otherwise, is that there are industries that did not create PFAS, did not incorporate PFAS into materials or products, then sold those materials or products into commerce for use. And then downstream, that would be recyclers in the waste management industry, end up handling them and being stuck with all the attributes kind of, you know, without a choice. I mean, I'll tell you, for private sector recyclers, don't have to recycle anything. They can just sit on their hands. Not that that's good business practice, but um, if, if the recycling industry doesn't take it, it goes to waste because there's nowhere else for it to go. So it's kind of this, you squeeze a balloon over here, it pops out over there and vice versa. Um, you know, the idea is that it should be the people who made it and chose to use it that should have the responsibility for the adverse attributes of it rather than the unfortunate you know, entities that end up receiving it and, and and maybe even unknowingly, largely unknowingly for a long time, for decades. No one was reporting this. There weren't SDSs that said it had PFAS. Concentrations are probably too low anyway. So there's a lot of sort of lack of awareness and suddenly everyone's aware and now it's okay, we've stopped the music and if you're not in a seat, you're out. So um, use a musical chairs analogy, but you know, that's kind of the situation we find ourselves in is we're gonna find requirements suddenly apply for things that, you know, we couldn't have a, we could not have avoided. And, the, and what that means is that we shouldn't be stuck with, say, the liability in the case of CERCLA or other things or other regulations. We'll have a you know, RECRA, TOSCA, Clean Water Act. I mean, the, the other, it applies to all the regulations. CERCLA, I think, is the one that's most pressing. One, because it's almost here, at least I think July 8th is the day it takes effect. Although uh, I imagine that that might not um, end up being the actual effective date. But um, you know that has liability and I'm not worried about EPA, I'm worried about every other you know, party that might choose to sue under it. EPA has discretion and might use it arbitrarily, but I'm not worried particularly about EPA. So I'll, I'll go next. Um, the uh, CERCLA, rule when it was finalized, EPA, as um, Megan, you already noted, included um, a separate document where they said they were going to offer discretionary enforce enforcement for certain sectors. And it was primarily the passive receivers. Um, and within that, they did identify public sector uh publicly owned, publicly operated landfills. Uh, our members are privately owned. Um, so privately owned, privately operated. So they didn't fall 
directly and neatly in one of the categories. So uh, the discretionary enforcement didn't really apply to them. Although there is a separate section in that same document where they acknowledge that um, facilities that largely operate in the same purview as one of the um, discretionary enforcement categories would presumably be treated the same. And they had kind of, EPA had kind of pointed our members to that language and said, okay, see, you, you might be able to qualify under that. But unfortunately, discretionary enforcement is just that. It's discretionary and it could change. It's got no force of rule of law or you know, regulatory impact. And then, of course, having that discretion upon discretion um, does not give us the warm fuzzies that they had intended. Um, that being said, uh, with CERCLA, so Superfund, it's related to contaminated site. It's, you know, you didn't have to do anything wrong. You can just be held liable if you're found to have contributed in any way to the contamination of a site. And um, unfortunately, uh, to David's point about manufacturers should assume some of the responsibility, there is within CERCLA a useful product um, uh, exemption. So if you made a useful product, um, then you are now exempted from CERCLA. So uh, we, with our waste, are not making useful products. Um, we are trying to manage the waste. Um, and so for us to be able to claim uh, a useful product ban uh, exemption, that's not going to apply to us. But all the manufacturers can use that and hide behind that shield. And so um, our main concerns aren't necessarily our uh, landfill sites themselves. I think we're prepared to take care of those. Um, and those costs can be... Um, contain relatively easily. It's the larger sediment sites that are our main concerns because they tend to be extremely expensive to clean up and the lawsuits alone um, are, the litigation costs alone are uh, tremendous. And so the there's examples like um, the Portland Harbor, uh, one of our members got pulled into that, um, is deemed... Um, pretty minor, um, and yet they're going to spend millions just in litigating uh, just to be able to be told that they didn't do anything that qualified for them to be anything but a minor player. So those are where we get really concerned because with CERCLA, it's more money seems to be spent on litigation than on actual cleanup. If I may just uh, yeah. add in to, to, to your comments, just quickly, uh, that might suggest that CERCLA isn't exactly a good law to address the problems that PFAS entails. Exactly. Um, but if that's your only tool, I guess that's what gets used. I'm sorry, Kristen. Oh, uh, no problem. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, you know, we there is that EPA enforcement discretion kind of policy memo that says they don't intend to pursue action, but yeah, it's not law. It can change. Um, and also, even with that protection, it doesn't actually protect a passive receiver from, you know, liability under from other parties. Um, it just causes a lot of concern. So thinking about kind of having those a narrowly tailored exemption as a statute is really what we've been pursuing. Because, um, again, we do see our sector as part of the solution. But to be part of the solution, we don't want to have that liability risk. Um, you know, we want to be able to accept these materials. Um, and thinking about, you know, to the point of the legal fees, we've heard a lot of stories about stuff getting caught up in court for years and years and the amount of legal fees it takes. And that's a cost burden on the ratepayers. You know, if you think about a municipal landfill and they're trying to run their landfill, but also handle, you know, whatever legal fees, um, that all goes back to the ratepayer. So, and we know there's just rising costs with everything. I mean, we haven't really gotten to the cost factor yet, but this just kind of adds to that concern. Um, so yeah, we are continuing to pursue you know, some legislative protection and have had a lot of good conversations around that. Um, and that's been ongoing for you know, quite some time at this point. Um, and you know, it is positive conversations, but um, we'll see what happens. Yeah. If I may reflect, um, on, if I may reflect on that, because um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned talking about rate payers because at least in my uh, limited observation of how discussions about sort of passive receivers or conduit facilities have gone. 
uh, it seems like there is interest in excluding or exempting industries that are based on sort of taxpayer you know, revenues rather than private industry, simply because if the taxpayers are paying for the services, but then the taxpayers would pay if they didn't pay, it's kind of sort of the same bucket. So they kind of just say, why go through that? But private industry doesn't typically get that kind of uh, regard, mm -hmm. even if they have exactly the same problem, that, that the informational information is lacking, the ability to avoid it is lacking. It just seems that there's less of an appetite uh, for for certain industries to get similar types of protections simply because of sort of who's paying, sort of who pays. So just, yeah. just kind of put that out there gently. Yeah, thanks, David, for bringing that up. And I use, you know, municipal landfill owners as an example. But if you think about, like, it is the municipality that is responsible for handling the waste that their residents produce, right? So many, in many cases, you know, the municipality doesn't own the landfill. They're taking it to a private landfill, and they're still paying the tipping fees there. So any increase in disposal costs still go back to that resident and whatever fees they're paying, either through property taxes or individual fee agree that. for yeah. that waste collection and treatment. So... Yeah, it affects every every person really, um, and and but yeah, that's back to the municipality and you know the cost of the PFAS treatment. But if you think about it, it's the same kind of bucket of money of many other costs that are going up. If you think about um, you know even replacing lead and copper pipes and all the many other things that municipalities are facing with, there's you know so many unfunded mandates um, in place and that are coming down the road. Um, so that's a whole other webinar that we've been concerned with. Yeah, a whole other <laughs> webinar. <laughs> Um, and we're getting into some of the, the stuff I, I wanted to dig into next, which is some of the operations stuff. I mean, and which goes into the costs and um, all these things. I'm curious just sort of about um, how um, companies in your industries are addressing PFAS mitigation now. Um, I mean, are they there yet? What sort of the, where are we seeing um, mitigation strategies happening and like, what do those look like currently? Um, I know that before some of these regulations, I was hearing from, you know, companies like, well, you know, we're waiting to see, we have some options, but now we are really seeing these companies um, making big announcements about um, investments they're making um, for mitigation strategies. So um, yeah, what, what are sort of the, the top ways that people are handling it now? And where are we gonna see the investment really go? in the next couple of years? So um, for us, you know, we're trying to look at trying to do some pretreatment on uh, the leachate. Um, so there are several options. Some of our landfills actually have access to deep well injection, which EPA says is one of the best ways to manage any PFAS containing materials. So if uh, the leachate can go for deep well injection, great. Um, it doesn't require any sort of pretreatment. Um, but for those that continue to utilize wastewater treatment plants, they're probably going to be looking at pretreatment requirements from that those pre um, those uh, POTWs at some point in the future. So there's a lot of efforts by our members to look at what pretreatment options are available to them. Uh, Many of our members have started uh, with pilot plants. They're looking at a number of different technologies, um, everything from uh, granulated, granular activated carbon um, or GAC, um, foam fractionization, fraction ah, I can't ever get these words out, foam fractionization. I never, I never have to say them out loud, so yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Um, foam frac. Uh, well, we always just say foam frac. That's why I never say the whole thing. So foam frac is also quite uh, um, becoming more common with some of the pretreatment pilot plants. Um, and we've seen uh, like reverse osmosis if they're going to get it to a point where they're actually doing direct discharge. Um, as far as full scale plants um, that are in place, I think one of my members has a full scale plant in place. And that is in particular, they were a little bit more aggressive about it because they knew that state rules were gonna come down and they were going to have to um, be in compliance with some of those state rules. Um, but everybody else is anticipating federal rules coming down and they wanna make sure that they have good solutions in place. So EPA did make the announcement in January of last year that they were going to establish ELGs um, for uh, pretreatment requirements for landfills. And so the industry is 
in the process of exploring what the best options are. And it might not be the same for every landfill. So I would expect um, foam frack, GAC, deep well injection, and potentially RO to be the four technologies that are going to be used most frequently. But um, there could be others as well that come out. I'm just going to mention too that this is also an opportunity to think about like what is coming down the road and the focus right now is PFAS, but what other emergent contaminants are there and what technologies can treat those. So, you know, is it, do you invest more now in a technology that you think can treat these other materials, you know, acknowledging there's a lot of unknowns around it, um, but it's, you know, there's more coming, we think. Um, so thinking about, you know, what technologies to get in place. Um, but yeah, I mean, in general, I think it's really encouraging to see how many pilots are in place, you know, how much investment is happening to really find solutions. Um, there's go to any show and there's, you know, just so many solutions being highlighted and uh, a lot of different options. Um, so it, I think, you know, it, it's a positive trend how quickly the industry is adapting and innovating and uh, the technologies that are out there. Um, I think, I don't know if we mentioned this, um, the EPA recently released like an interim guidance document around um, treatment instruction technologies that has some useful information in it as well. Um, and, you know, looks at the, um, kind of does an analysis, kind of high level of analysis of them and comparing the different options. Um, so that's also can be uh, good for um, the attendees to take a look at. But, but to David's earlier point about um, how the manufacturers are not being held to their feet, to their fire, obviously there is litigation by some of the state's attorneys on them. But um, one of the things like Minnesota did a study um, about the unaffordability of uh, cleaning up PFAS. And in that, in that study, one of their conclusions was that it takes about $50 to $100 uh, to manufacture a pound of PFAS, um, or I'm sorry, fifty to a thousand dollars to manufacture a pound of PFAS, but to remove a pound of PFAS costs between two point seven million and eighteen million dollars. So, one of the things that they really highlighted on how unaffordable it was and how um, the, you know, trying to treat something from the end of the pipe is a lot more challenging. Yeah, and you bring up a good point because I mean, this is in general we're wondering like, well, how much is this going to cost the industry? Um, and we see different ways to measure that. How I mean, how are your members sort of like budgeting for this? Um, especially when you're you're kind of giving this example of a pretty uh, big difference between like the it, just in general how much it, it costs to to clean up. But yeah, like how are how are people budgeting for this? What where is this showing up in their you know, their budgets, how much money are they, they spending on this? Can, can I just go back to the previous one? Cause uh, I didn't get a chance to uh, talk about what the industry is doing. So for our industry, yeah, we have very different kinds of members. We have members that focus on recycling appliances and automobiles and say other structural metal. You've got those that focus on electronics, those that focus on paper, and they each have different relationships, so to speak, if I use that term with PFAS. So what they're doing is going to be very specific to the kinds of materials that they're designed to receive and receive. So it's hard to know exactly what they're doing. I think regulations might push it, for instance, to the extent that, say, a state stormwater permit might require either identification of potential sources or require monitoring. There's been a few cases of that. Um, that will lead to discovery of sort of where it's showing up and maybe ways to uh, sort of not receive it. But... Uh, you know, the, the, the challenge is, is that if it's in everything, your alternative, at least if you're really going to be 100% certain, is to receive nothing. And all that does is actually move materials to the waste industry because it has nowhere else to go. So it's kind of this balloon that, that gets squeezed here or there and it you know, puffs out where in the opposite place it gets squeezed. So I think there kind of has to be a kind of a holistic solution to it. But um, you know, there have been suggestions of, you know, put uh, granular activated carbon or GAC on the end of a, of a treatment, but that doesn't really solve the problem. That may solve the regulatory issue, but it doesn't really solve the overall problem. Of how can we avoid receiving it in the first place? And if we can't avoid receiving it, how do we detect it and separate it? It's either unknowable at this point, or it's going to be prohibitively expensive. And, you know, our industry, you know, it's, you know, the profit margins are, are really tiny. So, if you have to add a destruction technology to the PFAS, you do extract, 
that might turn the whole proposition upside down. So rather than being an industry that buys its inputs and sells its outputs, it might be more like charging to receive something. Um, so it, it can change the nature of the industry just because the economics are so challenging. Uh, I wish we were making huge profit margins, but that's really not the way the industry works. Um, so yeah. it, 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 it will have significant economic impacts and it also will affect consumers because let's say, I'll just throw this for an example, it's hypothetical, but you know, let's say you know, people get, let's say, trade in value for their automobile because maybe it can be sold as, as reused. But if the so-called scrap value is negative, then they actually have to pay someone to take it off their hands because there's a total cost at the end of life rather than it being valuable because of, you know, say, the regulatory requirements that are applicable to handling and processing and recycling all those materials. So it, it's a really big economic question, too. Yeah. And I mean, are you seeing recyclers like implement any of these examples that you gave? Like, how are recyclers like practically handling this right now? Is this kind of still just, you know, we're in hypothetical terms, people are trying to figure it out? We're trying to figure it out because if you look at different regulations, PFAS is defined differently. Under some regulations, at least what they regulate, it doesn't include, say, floral polymers, but other ones do. So it's sometimes in and sometimes out, even all at the same time under different regulations, or, and even state regulations might be different. So you've got different federal regulations, got different state regulations. They might all regulate the same thing, but regulate it differently. So mm -hmm. I guess you have to go with the most stringent, but if it requires different things, it's a challenging environment to try to navigate from a regulatory perspective. So I, 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 I foresee a lot of challenges in in that in that sort of uh so to your follow-up question um megan on how things are being budgeted so on the one hand there we anticipate it's going to add a lot of cost to the industry we're going to have to do pre-treatment we're going to have to be really aware uh a lot of our members are looking at their waste acceptance policies as well um but there is also an opportunity um, from, you know, a disposal perspective. If we know that material has high concentrations of PFAS, they are looking at that material as special waste, and they might upcharge some of those um, customers for managing those materials. They might direct that material to specific facilities um, that are more... Um, uh, better situated to handle it. So looking at it purely from a landfill perspective, not all landfills are the same. Obviously, some of them have access to deep well injection. So if you have a facility that, okay, um, if a high concentration PFAS material were received, but they have deep well injection right there on site, they can manage their leachate pretty cleanly without having any outputs. Um, alternatively, if you have a facility that um, doesn't really is in an arid area that doesn't really generate any um, leachate, that might also have a positive impact. So uh, there might be different considerations and different landfills might handle it um, differently. So there, but I, I would say on average, um, this is going to be a greater burden on landfills that are smaller, uh, just because um, an economies of scale perspective. And so the larger landfills, um, you know, are going to be able to handle it a little bit better. Uh, they won't have to add as much to their tip fees as some of the smaller landfills might have to. Yeah, I want to add too, there is some federal funding available, um, but mainly for drinking water uh, and wastewater um, testing and treatment. So, you know, that that's a good that the you know federal government is looking at that and providing that funding um that funding isn't available to you know private sector um so it's limited in its effectiveness in that way um and i think the other thing with budgeting for this since the regulations for leachate aren't there you know the drinking water uh, regulations are finalized but it's hard to really budget for something and put it in place when you don't know what the final regulatory landscape looks like um, you know, I think especially with a municipal budget, it's and you if you have a tight budget, it's kind of like what's the most urgent thing right now that we need to fund. Um, so I think some of this will depend on you know what happens over the next few years, but certainly um, you know I think everyone is starting to think about it and hopefully starting to think about how to work it into their longer term budgeting. 
Yeah. And I wanted to get to some audience questions about some of these other uh, destruction and detection methods too. Um, uh, someone was asking about uh, what do we know about PFAS in landfill gas collection and flares? Um, and you know how, how is that being addressed right now? So I'm going to say um, there was a new report that was done um, by Tim Townsend. I haven't had a chance to uh, read it because I, I just became aware of it that talks about the potential uh, PFAS in landfill gas. Um, so I can't really address it. I can I can point you guys to that article. Um, so I can only base it on previous information. So obviously PFAS is a large class of chemicals. Um, so when they looked at PFAS in the past in uh, gas, it was primarily, um, I think six, colon two FTOS was the um was the primary PFAS in gas. So it's not necessarily going to be the ones that are being regulated in the drinking water. So it's not going to be um well and what is the higher concentration PFAS in the gas are uh usually um ones that are more volatile. So it's not generally the PFO and PFOS, um, but it's some of the, um, it's it's a different set of PFAS that generally ends up showing up in the gas. That being said, um, there's a new report and I haven't, I haven't had an opportunity to really review that. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that aspect of it? We also had another question about um, flu uh, incineration, um, which is another technique we haven't talked about much. We have a couple, we have only a few minutes, but if anyone wants to kind of touch on this too, another person was asking about um, what do we know about um, destruction of PFAS in flue gas and incinerators? Um, I know incineration is something that uh, people are investing in. Um, where are we at with that? What's, what are you guys thinking about that? So I don't know about um, municipal incinerators, but I do know that on the most recent um, destruction and disposal guidance that EPA released, they are starting to say that hazardous waste incinerators are um, an acceptable uh, use for high, highly concentrated PFAS material. So um, I think the... Um, those facilities have demonstrated uh, destruction up to six nines, I guess 99.999% um, but I'm not familiar with municipal solid waste um, uh, facilities. I did want to make like a really quick plug uh, that Waste I did do a story about this recently. Um, we do have our whole um, page of all of our PFAS stories which I'm putting in the chat in case you want to read more about that. Um, we only have a couple minutes left, but I think this uh, audience question uh, is a really nice way to sort of send everyone off. Um, Patrick was asking about sort of the long-term future uh, for um, removing PFAS and things like that, and was asking how can the industry prepare for being the major environmental source of PFAS in the foreseeable future? I take that question to mean sort of like where, wh what role does this industry play in the future? But curious what your sort of Final thoughts are on that. Uh, well, Megan, sorry, on the last question, I, I wanted to say that um, SWANA had a research report come out uh, just a few years ago on PFAS uh, transport and waste energy facility. So that could be of interest. It did show um, that there is some level of effectiveness in waste energy facilities for destruction. Great. Sorry to cut you off there. Yeah, no problem. Um, in the future, yeah, I'll, I guess, like I've been saying, we think that. Um, there's been a lot of positive developments in the last few years, and we really do see ourselves as part of the solution. And so thinking about getting that, um, you know, protection in place for passive receivers and really being able to move the path forward and looking at landfills and incinerators, um, you know, as a solution for containing this material and really having the technology in place to, you know, be able to detect it and treat it and destroy it. Um, so I know we're running low on time, so I'll hand it off to others. The only thing I'll say is that, you know, we know that PFAS are everywhere. I think there was just a, 
recent study on um, seafoam, which said that the seafoam uh, had concentrations of PFAS that were 100,000 times greater than the water that uh, the seafoam was in, and that it might be a major source of PFAS in our air. Um, so we know that it's out there. We're trying to, as an industry, really focus on what we can do to make sure that we are containing it. And um, based on all the studies, you know, we know that the vast majority of it is contained and we're going to continue to improve. Um, again, I want to thank uh, B Wastewise for inviting me to participate. Um, you know, we're still in the recycling industry in a bit of an exploratory period, trying to figure out you know, where it's coming from and whether we can isolate it and how we can isolate it. But certainly we're interested in uh, addressing the problem and, and certainly uh, advocating for its removal from the economy in the first place or source reduction and otherwise trying to uh, address the issues that affect not only recycling industry, but, but you know, the economy and the population generally. So we'll try to be good stewards in that in that direction, but it takes a bit more research and, and information to see how most cost effectively we can do that. I think it's important to add that it is conversations like this. You know, we're all figuring this out together. So as much as we can collaborate and discuss and share knowledge as we you know come across it, and everyone kind of sharing what they're learning and what they're coming across is so key. Um, yeah, and thank you very much for having me as a participant. Appreciate it. Again, next year. <laughs> More questions next year, for sure. I'll have more questions for you next week. So um, we'll have it thanks. solved by then. It'll be yeah, all fixed. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for making time to uh, to chat and to tune in. And thanks to be waste wise. And um, we'll see you at the next one. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank yeah. you, everybody, for, for attending. Thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye.